Hey guys, Moidog here, and today we'll be going over everything you need to know to use mortars in squad, from reading the mortar sites, to squad composition, and even to some advanced mortar strategy for you more experienced players out there. By the end of this video, you should be able to easily jump on a tube and rain down some hurt on the enemy. But before we dive in, I do want to remind everyone that I stream a lot of squad on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Moidog. I squad lead, run vehicles, and I play practically every kit in the game. So if you have any questions, want to watch some squad live, or simply spend some time chatting with the community, come hang out with us. And if you're still looking to pick up squad or other tactical shooters, or maybe some channel merch, make sure to check out my official game store at moidog.gg where your purchase supports me directly. Even with tanks, helicopters, and spandrels, nothing quite compares to the frustration that a good mortar team can cause the enemy. Mortars are incredibly oppressive, and when they're fired accurately, they can pin infantry, level emplacements, and even knock out vehicles. We'll go over the exact ways that I like to set up my mortar squad and more of the strategy side of things later on, but first, let's go over the basics. Unlike some games where mortars may be self-carried, most notably the knee mortars in games like Postscriptum or the various mortars in the Battlefield series, in squad, mortars Mortars are restricted to the FOB radius, and are one of the many emplacements your squad leader can put down for you. Additionally, since they are emplacements, anybody can use them, including enemy players. Do keep in mind though that these projectiles are armed the moment they leave the tube, so when you are placing them, make sure you have plenty of room overhead and to the sides to allow the mortar to shoot, or you might find yourself blowing up instead of the enemy. There are some variations between the mortar models themselves, such as the blue four factions having 81mm mortars and red four factions having 82mm mortars. For all intents and purposes, a mortar round will do the same amount of damage and have the same effective range no matter what faction you use it from. The key difference, however, is that the mortars for unconventional factions, like insurgents and irregular militia, only cost 250 build each, whereas conventional factions mortars cost 300. When using the mortar, you'll have the choice between high explosive or HE and smoke rounds. Once on the tube, use the scroll wheel to select between the two different rounds and use R to reload. Each reload takes 25 ammo from the fob and allows you to fire three mortars, more commonly referred to as a volley. One thing to keep in mind is that the 25 ammo is used whether or not you shoot all three rounds or not. So in order to make the best use of your ammo, it's much better to fire off the entire volley before reloading. Additionally, you can reload each type of round separately, allowing for both the HE and smoke to be loaded and ready if you do ever need to swap over to them. When using the mortar, you can right click it to see the special mortar sight. Although you can move and fire the mortar without using these sights, this will allow you to accurately find and correct the range in what is called miller radians. On the left, you'll see that each range has a specified miller radian or mill, which you can then adjust to on the main sight picture. Although this might look intimidating, it's actually extremely straightforward. For example, to hit targets at 100 meters, you'll see that 100 meters is equal to 1,558 mils, 400 meters is 1,430 mils, and 1,100 meters is 1,039 mils. Simply range to the correct mill in your sight, make sure you're lined up facing the right direction, and fire away. If you're not sure the exact range or direction, more often than not, squad leaders mark the mortar target with an observation mark, giving you a nice little green eye at the bottom of your screen to line up to. With this, we can also see that the effective range of mortars is up to 1250 meters, with the ability to fire as close as 50 meters. Since mills also only go up by 50 meter increments, we can also use this to guess non-exact ranges as well. So if 500 meters is 1387 mils, and 550 meters is 1364 mils, then 525 meters would be around 1380 mils. As we'll soon see, mortars don't land exactly on the mark you want them to, so if you're within a few meters, it's okay, and it's best practices to have someone help you dial them in anyways. So don't worry if your first few rounds are off a bit. Do note that the further away the target is, the lower the mill you'll need. So if someone does ask you to bring the mortars closer, you'll actually have to go up in mills. This can be confusing, but simply verify with the cheat sheet on your left and you'll be good to go. Now that we're able to actually use the mortars and their sights, it's important to know how the rounds travel and land in order to use them effectively. When dealing with mortars, all you have to remember is the number 20. On average, mortars take roughly 20 seconds from when they leave the tube to hit their target, mortars can land anywhere within 20 meters of their target, and the damage radius for a mortar is roughly 20 meters. 
Now, I know that there's going to be someone out there that says, hey, max range mortars actually only take 17 seconds in the air or the actual kill radius for an infantry player is 10 meters. But I want to give you guys something to actually use in game. 20 seconds and 20 meters is easy to remember and more often than not will be just about accurate. To help prove this, I fired mortars at the 50 meter mark on the range, ran within 20 meters of the target, and waited. Most of the time, I just received some minor splash damage. Every once in a while, I received some major damage, and a couple of times, I was insta-killed since the mortar did land on that random 20 meter mark. To make this easier to understand, let's take this position for instance. We've ranged this target and will send one volley or three rounds of HE. Instead of landing all in the same spot, the mortars will randomly land anywhere within this 20 meter radius. This means that the potential kill zone is actually further than 20 meters from the target, depending on where the round actually hits. This is important to note, especially when coordinating mortars with friendly infantry. By using a mortar mark on the map and relaying what your mortar team is doing in command comms, friendlies will be able to know how long they will have to wait until pushing into the area, as well as being able to position themselves far enough away to not get hit. Additionally, mortars are also affected by at what elevation you're firing from and what elevation the target is at. For example, if we're on ground level and fire a mortar to a target that is 500 meters also on ground level, it will fly in a predictable path in order to reach that distance. However, if we increase our elevation, we can actually see that this trajectory will now result in the round flying further than before. This has the opposite effect if the target is above us or on the side of a hill, as the elevation will cause the round to impact sooner than usual. Since in an actual game of squad, you're firing mortars at varying elevations and non-exact distances, this can cause your mortars to land in places you don't want them to. This is where a spotter will come in handy to help adjust as needed. Here, I place two mortar tubes that are 900 meters away from the radio tower on Kohat. The mortar at the same elevation as the tower was able to hit right on, whereas a tube below the tower would land roughly 30 meters in front of the target. Although this may not always cause a lot of problems and simple adjustments can get you back on target, do be aware that maps with a lot of hills can definitely cause your mortar's headaches when trying to dial the rounds in. With the specifics down, we can now actually start taking out targets. With arguably the most important mortar targets you'll see in game are the HAB and radio. As we just learned, mortars aren't completely accurate, so we need to take advantage of the relatively cheap and fast reload speed to send multiple mortar volleys to increase our chances of knocking out the enemy spawn. I don't want to get into the weeds here with damage models and math and all that wonderful stuff, but just know that your typical HAB has 500 health and each mortar does about 60 damage to it. To disable the HAB, you need to do about a third of its total health, which will then remove the roof and prevent players from spawning in it. To keep it simple, you need to hit the HAB with three direct mortar rounds in order to ensure it goes down. Irregular militia HABs only have 400 health and insurgent HABs only have 300, however, so for those ones, you actually have to hit those a little bit less. After a bunch of testing, over 120 volleys on conventional HABs, I found that on average, you'll need about 5 volleys or 15 mortars to knock out a HAB. So if you found yourself dialed in on a position, this is the minimum you'll want to send out to ensure it gets disabled. I've had some volleys get lucky and knock the HAB out with all 3 rounds landing directly on top of it, and other volleys completely miss over and over again, taking up to 33 total mortars just to knock it out. So don't get discouraged if they don't land correctly immediately. It is all pretty random. Our second target would be the radio, which isn't always in the open, but if it is, it's a much softer target and has only 300 health. Mortars do roughly 120 damage to radios, and one direct hit can disable it, with two direct hits and some splash damage, putting it into bleed out. During my radio testing, I found that on average, two volleys will disable the radio, and five volleys will put it in bleed out. The big takeaway here is that if you are trying to disable enemy HABs, radios, or other structures, it's much better to simply send as many volleys as possible. But the bare minimum to really confirm any destruction would be 5 volleys. Increasing the volleys will also prevent players from shoveling up the HAB or radio as well, since they won't be able to get within 20 meters of the area due to the random splash damage. When we're trying to hit infantry, however, you can actually take advantage of this variance, as more often than not, the targets won't be in the same position for long. For infantry targets, I like to have my mortars fire directly on the mark, but then move a little left and right in order to account for infantry movement. These can be extremely effective, but if you're trying to hit troops actively moving, do take the flight time into account and make sure to give your mortars far enough of a lead. Although emplacements in infantry are the most common targets, 
mortars can be effective against vehicles. More often than not, vehicles will move once fired upon or they start taking damage, but it's not impossible to destroy them. Your lighter vehicles like transports, lodges, and techies are your best targets, but other good vehicles to hit are ones that are typically one-manned, like scout cars and chromat bees. In the current squad meta, many times one squad leader will lock a squad, grab a pilot kit, and hop in the vehicle themselves in order to park it somewhere and snipe at long range. So taking advantage of their inability to move quickly makes for a great target. For other vehicles, technically you can destroy them with mortars, but unless they are disabled in some way, I really wouldn't waste the ammo. As you can see here, I parked a Bradley that has been engined and a BMP2 that has been tracked, and it took a crazy amount of time just to destroy them. Usually it's more effective to let your anti-tank or other vehicles deal with these, but if you are able to send HE on a disabled vehicle, you will prevent crewmen from dismounting and repairing, which is also extremely important. This isn't necessarily a bad strategy at all, just make sure you're on the command net or within squad comms and try to get anti-tank over there as soon as possible. If you are patient enough, you can also destroy a tank with mortars, but once again, I would only do this if I was preventing crewmen from repairing, as it's a pretty poor use of ammo. For smoke mortars, the key things to note here are that because the rounds do have this random landing pattern to them, smoke may not actually cover the area you want them to. The smoke lasts for about 30 seconds, so definitely send out quite a few volleys to make sure the area is totally covered. I tend to use smoke when assaulting over large open areas or entrenched positions, but make sure you don't smoke wherever you have to run through. If the enemy are set up in this farm, for example, make sure to smoke the wall instead of the field itself. It's also not a bad idea to have HE and smoke mixed together in order to confuse the enemy even more. And if you do have two tubes, the combination of disorienting smoke and HE mortars will make it a much easier position for your infantry to attack. Now when it comes to in-game mortar strategy, we typically have dedicated and non-dedicated mortar squads. A dedicated mortar squad is one that will only run mortars, and is usually 3-4 to four people, comprising of 2 men on the mortar tubes, 1 lodgy driver, and 1 squad leader. This is also not a bad squad to take the commander role as well, since you should be relatively safe behind your lines, you're always going to be next to a hab, and you should have plenty of time to open your map and interact with your team. With a dedicated Logi driver, you shouldn't have to worry about ammo, but I will say that you need to be aware of your team's needs, and I've been in plenty of games where a dedicated mortar squad will not give up the team's only Logi since they are using it to supply themselves. It's important to help your team out since mortars are useless if you don't have the boots on the ground to follow up. I typically run non-dedicated mortar squads, which essentially is any other squad that has a fob with a mortar tube on it. Usually, I will place a mortar on fobs that are objectives since the audio of a mortar firing is in incredibly loud, and if you have that mortar tube on your secret attack fob, it can easily give away your hab location. Other fobs, if I'm trying to actually secure an area and more or less super fob it up a bit, I may place multiple emplacements, guns, repair stations, and so on in order to use whatever would be the most useful for my team. This is not a bad idea for 9-man squads, since I will still have my go-to mortar players who can run over to the tube whenever we have a mortar mission, but they aren't stuck on the mortars exclusively. In my opinion, this is a much more effective way to use mortars, since you'll have more eyes and ears looking out for the enemy instead of two players just staring at a map and miller radians. Whether you're running a dedicated mortar squad or not, the mortar strategy is essentially the same. You'll need to first find your target, dial in the range, and fire until destroyed. We mentioned this previously near the start, but the quickest way to do this is to have your squad leader mark with an observation mark in order to show the distance and direction. Do note that after 300 meters, ranges are not exact, and you'll only be able to see the range to the nearest 50 meters. This is why it's never a good idea to fire mortars unless someone on your team can actually see them land and help adjust. When first dialing them in, I prefer to fire one volley and then wait for confirmation that they're on target. Adjust as needed, and once you see the rounds hitting either your target or within a few meters of it, let it rain. Another tactic that's common is walking in your mortars. To do this, place one observation mark where you wish to start your mortar fire, and then have the tube adjust either 100 meters up, down, left, right, whatever it is, so that way it will catch enemy players in that whole area. This is especially helpful in tree lines or even maps like Mutaha where you have a lot of low buildings, rooftops, and alleyways for people to hide in. Additionally, with two tubes up, you can increase your kill zone from a 20 meter radius to a 40 meter radius by giving one tube one mark, and another tube a separate mark. I like to do this to cover compounds or entry and exit points, since most players will expect mortar fire to be restricted to one area. 
We've talked a lot about the benefits of mortars, but one of the biggest weaknesses is just how loud they are when fired. If you're a dedicated mortar squad and know you'll be firing a lot of mortars throughout the match, it's best to find a spot that is within 1200 meters of the middle three objectives to ensure you're going to be useful on both offense and defense. I'd also recommend placing the fob nowhere close to your current objective, so if you are attacked, it means the enemy had to move somewhere completely out of their way to get to you. Additionally, when you do set up your fob, it's also a good idea to put up enough emplacements to protect your mortars from incoming fire. Mortars are an easy target for other mortars, so indirect fire bunkers, sandbag walls to hide behind in case of small arms, and a nearby ammo crate just in case is always good to have. Finally, to wrap this guide up, I do also want to go over a couple advanced strategies and tips that should help you in a real game. Although this might seem crazy, it is possible to run a four mortar mortar team. In order to accomplish this, drop two fobs next to each other, place the mortars in the middle, and then build around. The biggest issue you'll run into is supply, so a dedicated Logi runner splitting ammo between the fobs is a must. I'd also recommend placing a defensive rally somewhere outside of the fobs in case you do get overrun, and spending the time to build two halves on either side is always a good idea. This can be extremely effective if used well, but can also be a huge waste of resources and tickets if done wrong, so be careful. For squads on the move, my favorite tactic is dropping a quick radio in the middle of the woods, dropping my rally next to it, and unloading just enough build to get a mortar up. From here, I'll leave one person on the tube to start firing on our objective, while taking the rest of my squad on foot to push. This can catch the enemy completely off guard, but do remember to load the supplies back into the lodgy and dig down the radio afterwards so you don't waste tickets. In line with the quick drop mortar strategy, on some maps like Kohat, where you most likely won't have enemies coming in close right away, you can bring a loadout like 6 600 build and 2400 ammo so you can start sending mortars out as soon as possible. This does risk losing the fob if your rally is squashed and you do get killed, but more often than not you'll be okay to wait for a later build run on these larger maps. Also, if you do notice that enemies are moving out of large structures like hangars, buildings, or tunnel entrances, you can actually trap them in by mortaring the entrance and preventing them from leaving. Coordinate this with armor infantry and you can easily break through entrenched positions. Finally, although I don't use this tool myself, I feel like I'd be doing a disservice by not at least talking about mortar calculators. Mortar calculators allow you to plug your position in the target position into the map and it will then spit out the mills and direction that you need to put in to hit the target. It's incredibly effective and works for most squad maps, but personally, I don't like using it. I play squad to have fun, and part of the fun is working with my team to dial in mortars and then unload on the enemy when they're perfect. Min-maxing the mortars makes it a little less fun for me, and since I'm not a huge fan of using out-of-game resources while in-game, I'm not including a link to this. So if you really want to use it, simply drop in a Google search for squad mortar calc and you'll find it. If anything, it's not a bad idea to try to actually use it in offline mode so you can get a feel for how the elevation affects ranging. But that just about wraps up everything you need to know when it comes to using mortars in squad. Although knowing how to read the sights, understanding the elevation, and then trying out some of these cool fob strategies are always good, the biggest thing that you need to remember is that mortars are going to be useless without communication and infantry follow-up. Like everything in squad, it's a team game, and I will tell you right now that every team likes a good mortar squad that is actually being effective and not just sitting out in the middle of nowhere. If you think I missed anything or want to offer your own mortar suggestions, make sure to post your thoughts in the comments below. And if you liked the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more. I also want to give a special shout out to my patrons who help make guides like this happen. Thank you guys. I really appreciate it. But that's it for me. Until next time, peace. I don't know if they were just coming on rallies here in market, but we're not seeing anymore.